Carol Quantock. And Carol, uh, excuse me a moment. Uh, Carol uh, has been an active birder for over 40 years and is the vice president of the Audubon Society of the Capital Region, as well as editor of the newsletter, Wingbeats. Her fascination for birds evolved from extensive real-time experience observing nature at an early age, then by gardening and becoming a Cornell Cooperative Extension Master Gardener in May of 2021. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in geography and urban slash regional planning from SUNY Albany and a graduate management certificate from Cornell University uh, School of Industrial and Labor Relations. She's currently enrolled in a comprehensive bird biology course, uh, as well as other bird related mini courses. She's an accomplished sewist and also has a large doll collection. Are any of those dolls birds? Uh, I wish they uh, were. No, they're all they're all uh, fashion dolls. It's a long story. <laughs> so you can uh, share your screen as you need to. Okay. Carol. Okay. There we go. Intro to birding. Okay. So um, just want to give a little shout out to um, to uh, two organizations here: Saratoga Plan and Audubon Society of the Capital Region. Uh, a lot of the slides in this presentation come from, uh, were derived from the Saratoga Plan and ASCR um, collaboration a few years ago to get a, what we call Birding 101 presentation together. So I adapted, there are things from Cornell in here and then some of my own personal things in here that uh, will give us a, uh, I hope a nice presentation today. And for the uh, social this month, um, I am going to be working at the Hudson Valley Community College Flowers uh, Garden and Flowers Show at the Home Earth Alliance presentation or uh, display area down in the skating rink on the on Friday the twenty fourth and Saturday the 25th and that's the day of the social so I would be thrilled if people came and stopped and stopped in to see the uh, presentation it's it's a grassroots organization uh, called Home Earth Alliance it's kind of a brand new collaborative consortium anyway so it's uh it's going to be interesting it's, it's quite a learning experience for all of us so please come on down okay so for birding um, I know that we're probably all in various stages of bird watching. Some are brand new to it. Some people have been doing it for years. But here's the, the key to where do I go to see birds. I myself love my own backyard. But then again, I've got a good habitat. But my own backyard, native plants will attract birds. I have huge native plant gardens. Um, and even before I started native plant gardening, we still had a lot of birds around here because there was a designated, a DEC designated wetland in back of my property. And so there's a lot, nobody can build there. So there's a lot of wildlife. Um, if you put out bird feeders, you're gonna attract birds. Sometimes you're gonna attract things you don't really want, <laughs> but, uh, but at least it's good to see them and learn who they are and what they are. Um, my, um, there's a really good thing here on this slide. This is no bread or baked goods or processed foods. Buy good bird seed. Um, it's worth the expense. Um, yes, it's a lot more expensive, especially since the war in Ukraine, because their primary, one of their big exports is sunflower seeds, uh, which are a big big, especially birds around here, love sunflower seeds like cardinals and jays and um, your back, your general backyard birds that aren't uh, vermivores, you know, worm eating and insect eating birds. Um, it's really important to, uh, you know, just spend the money on it because you will waste less if you buy the good stuff. Uh, that's just a something I found over the years. If you go for the cheap stuff, you went, uh, especially red millet. Um, red millet seed is uh, just is like kind of a little aside here, but red millet seed will 
literally grow in your lawn. You don't really want that. <laughs> That's not something, it's, it's primarily a, it's a Western, uh, birds in the West will tend to eat that but birds in the east probably will not. So it's uh, don't get anything with the red millet in it. Um, and also baked bread is really not good for them. People that uh, you put out bread or moldy bread for the birds, it really doesn't do them any good. Um, they ingest that uh, the yeast and the bread and it's just uh, not good for their, their internal workings. There we go. When should I go birding? All right, so this is another uh, I prefer my own self. I like to go out really early in the morning because about five, five thirty in the morning in the springtime is just great because all it's all you hear in the morning is birds singing and chirping and uh, doing all sorts of mating calls. But you, there are usually like little waves of activity during the course of a day, so you can. Uh, Go out in the morning and spend a few hours out there and you can gauge for yourself when the birds are active, where uh, you might want to see them. Uh, bird activity, a lot of times dusk too. So if you are in a place where dusk birding is, especially for owls uh, and birds coming in to roost, they, they like, they're, they're gonna do that at dusk when it's just before the sun goes down. You might want to, you know, you're going to be overwhelmed when you start. It's 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 inevitable because you're, uh, it's going to be like, oh, where, you know, here's a bird here, here's a bird here. Um, it, you know, once it, they're going to come, <laughs> if you don't see one, you're going to see another one. It's not, uh, and you can't worry if you're not going to see something right away because sometimes you'll wait for a long time before you see something. Uh, you'll be looking in your binoculars for a long time. Um, this little slide says sit down to minimize physical presence. Well, yes, yes and no. It depends on where you are. If you're, you're on your back porch, that shouldn't be a problem. But a lot of times we'll be walking a trail and walking a trail is uh, not a good idea to, um, uh, to sit down, first of all, because of ticks and dirt and things you pick up from the soil and also you know you're it's it could be wet out there and you just don't that's a little uncomfortable for that kind of thing all right and we uh, how do we see birds all right well i find the most important thing when i'm out birding is listening because you can hone in on what you hear far easier than you can see something. And yes, it is absolutely acceptable in all the bird uh, associations, whether it's Audubon Society or American Bird Club, it is acceptable to write down a bird that you've only heard but not seen. So for instance, if you hear a pileated woodpecker call, which is distinguishable from just about anything else, um, you can write it down on your list of birds th that you saw, you know, or that you uh, quote sure. saw that day. Um, then you look for the movement in the trees, in the bushes, look around, and then you hone in your binoculars on that. There's a you know, slide, a few slides coming up on bin binocular tips. Um, sometimes the bird will be close enough that you'll be able to see it without binoculars, but that's pretty, that's not, that doesn't happen all the time, um, unless it's a huge bird. Um, so then you can get a better, better view by checking it out through your binoculars, which is our slide now. Um, binoculars are kind of, um, you can spend a lot of money on binoculars, trust me on that, um, or you can spend uh, very little money, but what you pay for what you get. Um, excuse me for a second. Oh dear. Uh, I thought I was gonna sneeze, pardon me. Um, binoculars are, um, I find that the best ones to get are seven power, eight power, that, that magnifies the, that's the amount of magnification. Any more than that is 
too much and any less than that is just too little and you won't be able to get a good view. Um, then, uh, so what you do is you, you unfold your binoculars and it's good to have this, you can see with my, my uh, cursor here, I am pointing to this pointer. This, is, this will help you focus in and then you've got your uh, your eyepieces here. If you are not wear, or if you're wearing glasses, just unfold uh, the eyepieces down. Good binoculars will have that capability. There's either screw to uh, to uh, unscrew them a little bit to get them closer to your glass or uh, closer to your eyes, or further away if you're wearing glasses like I do. Um, when you come up with your binoculars, if you're looking at my hands here. Uh, you just hold your elbows in and your binoculars up so you could, that, that will give you the most stable view. And that's what you want. You want stability because that bird isn't going to be sitting still. Uh, you want to, you don't want it to be shaky and, you know, because you're not going to be able to see anything and it's frustrating and it's, you know, that's not a, not what we really want here. And then you just focus, get the, get the binoculars in where you need them to be for your eyes, where it's comfortable. Okay, these, these are what I think the best tips. Uh, too much magnification makes them useless because what you're doing at that point, if you get anything over eight power, you're basically magnifying your hand movements. So if you're at all shaky, then you're just shaking along with it. And, uh, uh, the wide field of view, that is this part right here, the second number right there. It makes it easier for, to find birds. It's the field of view. There's a mathematical formula involved there. Um, but here's, these are, uh, according to the Audubon Society, these particular types right here are the best for bird watching. I myself have a pair uh, that are way too much for bird watching, but they were given to me as a gift and I can't really, you know, can't kick the gift horse in the mouth. Um, but Roger Tory Peterson used seven by 42s and I, you know, RTP was a guy to trust. <laughs> he knew his birds, um, but I had a pair of seven by 35s, which I still have and they're 43 years old. <clears throat> They are, they're fantastic birding. Um, I think by next pair I get will probably be eight by 40, a little bit, a little bit more uh, powerful. Um, but the more, the wider the field. So in other words, if you get, you know, if you're, if, if you think that the bigger the number is not necessarily true because then you're going to be decreasing your ability to actually see something clearly. Um, they should be waterproof and nitrogen purged. Um, that means you're going to be spending a little bit more money on them uh, because the cheap ones just don't have that and they're going to get all foggy when it, and a lot of times when you're out birding, especially in the springtime, it's going to be dewy or wet or misty and it's just going to, you know, it's just, it's not a good experience. Um, try before you buy. Uh, that's as simple as that. I, my suggestion would be to instead of going to like the local sporting goods store, go to a place where they know birds. And that's, uh, there's a place down in Del Mar called Wild Bird Junction. And there's a place up in Saratoga Springs, uh, Wild Birds Unlimited. Those are the only two actual bird places around here. There used to be uh, backyard birds in Latham, but uh, the lady that ran that, uh, uh, retired and uh, closed her shop. Unfortunately, she was she was excellent. Um, your binoculars should have coated optics, and uh, they'll tell the price will tell you that too. That's another thing you don't want to cheap out on that because it's uh, there's another you know that's the it's the life of the lens. It's there. It's worth it. It's worth every penny you pay for really good ones. Um, although you know you can spend. The, the real serious birders, not like me, I'm kind of an intermediately serious birder, but there are people out there who take this, who are in, so into this that they do this like their photography and you can spend a fortune on photographic equipment and op optical equipment for, for birds, which, you know, that's great for them, <laughs> but not for 
you know, just general run of the mill birders if you're going to be doing this a few times a year. Uh, but still, it's still good to get the coated optics uh, because you're not going to be um, you're going to be using them for a long period of time. Like I said, my my seven by thirty fives are forty three years old and it's still really good shape for their age. Um, clean them well. Um, that's you know that should be obvious. Like it's like your glasses that you wear. You don't want to scratch the lenses. Uh, it's a pretty funny thing. If you're if you're eating <laughs> when you're using your binoculars, put the lens caps on. Always put the lens caps on when you're not using them. It's the same as cameras. You don't want to don't want to damage those lenses. They're just it's not worth it. But anyway, so we go to find our bird. In this particular photo, this wren is right out in the open where you can see it. Most of the time, this is not going to happen. Um, most of the time they're going to be in branches, they're going to be in bushes, especially in the spring. They're going to be very well hidden because that's what they do. Uh, it's natural for birds to hide in bushes and because they're breeding and they want to, they want to be left alone. Um, but you look for the movement, you listen for that's why listening is really important because when you hear the calls and sound, you can aim your, aim your vision towards that area. Um, and don't um, one one thing that they they emphasize here is don't look down and then pull your just kind of lift your binoculars up. Don't look down to do that because then you're going to lose where you were. Um, and it's there's a nice little tri trick here to practice at home. You can or can't, you know, depending. I go out in the backyard and do mine all the time. Okay, so here's a good. This is a, a really good trick right here for focusing. Find a starting point. So in other words, if it's a, a branch, a very prominent branch or a prominent, just something that stands out near where you've seen this bird, you can, that helps you focus in on the bird. And there's, there's a nice little owl right in here. Um, so you're not gonna, <laughs> Um, so you just look at something that's very, and then when you're pointing it out to fellow birders, it's easier that way. Okay, it's near the, you know, the tree branch on the right, you know, it's a big tree branch, blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing. It's, uh, um, you can, uh, there's a great, yeah, that's the great horned owl in there, it's, which would be very hard to see normally. Okay, next, okay, how do I... <laughs> I like this is uh, our little drawing of a robin here. How to identify them? Um, clue number one. Okay, so you know um, in the spring, and you know that most birds actually, yeah, just about all birds are migratory. Even though they say they're non-migratory, most of them kind of wander around. They don't all stay in the same place. There's a breeding range. There's a winter range and there's a year round range. Now you see the, the robin is uh, in the, the contiguous United States, that's its year round range. So, but the robins that you see in the summer are not necessarily the ones you're gonna see in the winter. The ones that you see in the winter are probably heading north right now. They're heading up to Canada to breed. Same way with the, the robins that are down in Georgia, they're 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 probably coming back up from Florida or from Mexico. Um, there are some birds uh, that travel, like hummingbirds. That's just an amazing thing. Many of them, uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds, will travel all the way across the Gulf of Mexico in one shot. It's just amazing. Um, but you look for you have to kind of know. You read, that's where reading your bird books come in really handy because that way you will get to know which birds are heavy migratory birds and some that are not. Um, blue jays are another bird that is not a big migratory bird or around all the time, but birds like orioles and warblers and uh, uh, Juncos, which you see in the winter, but you don't see them in the summer because they're all heading back to Canada very soon uh, or points north. Um, the same with uh, 
let's see, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head here, lots of the winter, the winter birds that we don't normally see in the summertime up here. And habitat, this is really important because this is what tells you what you're gonna see for the most part. I always say expect the unexpected when I'm going birding because sometimes you don't expect to see something and you see it. Um, okay, so there's an urban environment, town or city, Usually it's robins and sparrows and uh, pigeons, uh, blackbirds. Um, and we have lakes, so you're gonna see water birds, loons, uh, diving ducks, uh, regular mallards, wood ducks. Same with, uh, uh, well, open woodland, bluebirds. Uh, bluebirds really like open, open land. Wetland, uh, wood ducks, and uh, birds that go after a lot more insects. And I'm going to move this out of the way a little bit. Okay, forest, forest, uh, wood thrushes. Uh, a lot of the thrushes hang out in the forest. So also hawks, owls. Um, hawks not so much, but some hawks will hang out just so they see what they can see in the you know, and then chase it into the open land. And shrubby areas, shrubby areas, uh, grassland birds, uh, meadowlarks, uh, bobolinks, uh, snow buntings, just, you know, all sorts of fun things. But the habitat pretty much determines what you're going to see or what you can reasonably expect to see. Right bird, right habitat. Okay, so there's the wood duck right there. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Probably one of the prettiest ducks there ever uh, that there are. This is a morning dove. And right here, I happen to have, and if you look at my picture here, up at me, uh, my screen, you can see this, these fun feathers. I found these out in front, or out in back near my feeder. These are morning dove feathers. We had a hawk strike yesterday, so there's another one. And uh, so there were little morning dove, big morning dove feathers all over the place out in my backyard this morning because a hawk ate. That was it's fine. It's nature. But anyway, uh, so where do these birds nest? Okay, so a wood duck near the water in the woods, their nests are not on the ground. Their nests are high. They nest in cavities is really interesting because they're, you know, this is so different. Um, morning doves, you will find them in this in urban areas, but mostly around here, and they tend to roost in, uh, in uh, evergreens, in, uh, in uh, coniferous trees. These, uh, these wonderful swallows, they are They'll, they're tree nesters, barn nesters, uh, generally swallows, purple martins are swallows. They're, you know, the, the, martin, the martin houses that you've seen um, where the just huge, huge uh, numbers of birds that live in there. Cardinals will nest in kind of a woodland area. Um, they're, uh, they're really good at doing that and they're very prolific too. Robins just out anywhere. Uh, I've had robins nesting in in the uh, in my carport, and on, in the roof of my house. They just uh, they love it. But anyway, the the point is there could they could also be elsewhere too. But you know, not not way out of character. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't see a wood duck in an urban area, probably not. And scale. This is really important when you're trying to determine what you what you're seeing. This is a great little graphic for that because, okay, so we all basically know how big a sparrow is. It's probably about five to six inches long, uh, just a little round bird, uh, little brown, they're brown usually, but you know what size it is and you know what about what size a robin is. So then you can kind of determine what you're seeing. Crow size, there's another good determinant point. Pretty much everybody knows what a crow looks like or how big a crow is. They can make that visual connection. And also with a Canada goose or a goose, we all pretty know. So you can kind of gauge what you're seeing uh, by the size of it. And then there's, there, uh, there's the, my little graphic about the uh, the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. 
these birds look almost exactly alike. And what determines is size and also the beak shape. If you look at this, this is, a, this is the downy woodpecker. It's a much smaller bird than the hairy woodpecker. Has a very small beak, very small pointed beak. The hairy woodpecker, much larger beak. So if you see one, you'd be able to see it. But now the, these are both male birds and you can see these, this is why they call them ladder backs because they have these nice little striations right here and their feathers on the back. Um, but the red is diagnostic of a male. Females do not have those little red uh, patches, which is true of also with uh, many woodpeckers. There's more red on the males than there is on the females um, going down the, down the line of woodpeckers. But these two are really almost uh, indistinguishable except for experience. You really should be able to see them. Um, I, last week I had the good luck of seeing both of them on my suet feeder at the same time. So it was really, you know, wow, yes, now I can, you know, you can see. I know the difference because I've been birding a long time, but if you see them together, you definitely know. But uh, this is, so that's how ID gets, you have to get really careful about your identification by size is really a good diagnostic point. May I ask you something, Karen? Sure. Going back to the previous slide, I don't know if it's a photographic um, incident, but it looks like the downy has less of a pure white tummy. Is that just? Uh, it is, it's in the photograph. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, they are black and white and red. You know, <laughs> black and white and red all over. Um, but they, yeah, they're pretty much, there are differences in the wings. I believe this patch is not as big on the back of a downy. Uh, it's just a, uh, but the big differences, of course, are the, the beak and the size. But I, and let's see, trying to. And you said which was bigger? The hairy woodpecker is much larger than the downy. Thank you. The, the, there's a, the, these arrows give the, so the, the uh, okay. downy is uh, between a sparrow and a robin and uh, Harry is about robin size, maybe a little bit bigger than that, but it's a different shape of a bird too. And that's another thing, shape uh, and how it sits on a branch or where it is. That's another big diagnostic tool. You're not gonna see robin sitting like this or you know, hooking onto the side of a, of a tree, not, no, because that's not what they do. It's uh, the robins will be on the ground uh, or in, on branches. Um, they're not going to hook on to a suet feeder like this because they don't really go for suet. Um, but that's another thing. What they're doing is also diagnostic too. If I, you, you won't see a woodpecker doing something that a water bird does, for instance. It's just not going to happen. And color. This is uh, another diagnostic. This is obvious, especially with male birds. Females, not so much because a lot of the female birds, most of are camouflaged. They're, they're brown, they're streaky, they are meant to be uh, in, the, in the woods, in the mess, bringing up their babies. That's what they do. Um, there is one really interesting uh, there's probably more than one bird that has a, uh, that the female is actually technically more colorful than the male, but the one that actually lives around here is the uh, belted kingfisher. The belted kingfisher is kind of this beautiful blue and white. The male is blue and white, but the female also has like a little rusty red uh, stripe across her, uh, the breast of the bird. And it's that's it's just really kind of it's I just think it's an interesting notation because that's how you and, and I don't know why you know who knows why that's just the way they evolved but uh, there must be something that I don't know what it is um, so color here's our our goldfinch very different from the bluebird you can also see that the bluebird has this more pointed bill for worm eating the finch is a cone shape 
and that's for breaking seeds. Uh, finches are seed eaters and uh, thrushes, which are bluebirds and robins and wood thrushes and hermit thrushes and uh, varied thrushes and all that thrush family. They are vermivores or insectivores. So they, they don't really eat seeds very often. I can't say it has never happened, but they don't, that's not their main diet. They like insects and caterpillars and worms. But color, if you look, look at all these birds that are black and yellow and uh, so, so not just, um, you can't just say that yellow and black because there's so many different ones. This is not the greatest picture of a, of a goldfinch because there is a lot of white on those wings that doesn't show up here. Um, I don't know why they included that photo. It's kind of a, not the greatest photo of a goldfinch, but uh, you know what they look like in the summertime. They are very gold and that yellow, bright, bright yellow and black and white, and uh, they're small. They're, they're about sparrow size, so we know that. So it's easier than trying to die, uh, try to put all those things together. It's easier to be able to distinguish what size it is. There's also bill shape. This is a, uh, this look at that shape of that. That's a very pointed, that is a black, or uh, one of the icterid family, which is kind of blackbird as opposed to, uh, and there's a yellow, yellow headed blackbird right here. Some of these guys are warblers too. Uh, there's an oriole here, which is, that's, a, uh, that's another member of the icterid family. This guy right here is an evening grosbeak, which is one of the big finches. You can tell by that big, huge, white, very conical beak. So there's so many different things to look at when you're trying to identify. But there's a lot, you know, because you can, and then you go to your field guide too. Okay, color and location on the body. There you can just barely see some of that white, but that's more distinctive in, uh, in real life. I, that's, uh, like I said, that's not the best, best photo. But okay, so right here in our slide, it says you won't always be able to tell by the body parts. You, you'll move around and you can take a look and the bird is gonna be moving too. So you, you know, you're gonna be able to see it from different angles. Even if you stand still, it's not going to be standing still all the time. Birds move constantly. Okay, this is an um, interesting slide. We have our red-winged blackbird which in the, they're back here now and they're back with their buddies, the starlings and the grackles and all those icterids, that's what they're called, icterids or the blackbird family. And they all have these very pointy, long beaks. The starling is in the, in the spring and the summer, the starling is this very spotty, uh, iridescent, very distinguished, short tail, yellow beak, very obvious what it is. They are all, um, just as a note, side note, they are not protected by the Migratory Bird Act, but red-winged blackbirds are. And red-winged blackbirds um, have these wonderful epaulets here, which are the male black or uh, red-winged blackbird. You can see them at all the time. Their call is very distinctive. Uh, as soon as March hits, actually we had them earlier this year, we had them in February their back and uh, they are, that's that conqueree call that we hear out near marshlands and you can see the males staking out their territory. And here's some field marks, eye rings and eye colors, beak color, leg color, throats, uh, wing bars, that's uh, right here, wing bars, patches and streaks or spots, crests like cardinals and tufted titmouse and uh, blue jays with crests. Stellar's jays out in uh, on the west and down south. Uh, Stellar's jays have gorgeous crests. There we go. Now here's two other very similar birds, but very distinctive too in that the white-breasted nuthatch, the size of that beak. Look at that. That's for pro. That's uh, white-breasted nuthatch is very very similar to. Uh, um, almost a woodpecker, but not quite. Uh, it has a stiffer tail and this long pointy beak 
for probing into tree bark and probing for uh, insects. Black capped chickadee, black and white, and a little bit of rusty color here. Also, uh, if you see one, if you see something black and white flying around, it you know could be either until you get a closer look. And the closer look will tell you this nice little tiny beak right there. That's for seed breaking. Um, they will grab a seed and then go over and pound on it to open it up. But there, but this is an easy, easy, they're easy to get confused because they are black and white and gray. And then so seeing one on the, you know, just glancing at it, you're not necessarily so it's study it and take a look and you know, be able to determine what it is, especially this is a really good field mark right there. And also what it's doing. Nut hatches. We are usually found on trees. They will go, they are the only bird that literally will circle down a tree upside down. They are, they're great to watch because of that. They're, they just, that's what they do. Chickadees don't do that. Ah, here's our hairy and our wood, hairy and our downy again. There's, you see the size of that bee as opposed to this one. And this, that's also hard to, yeah, if you look here, there's a little bit of difference here in the color of the feathers. It's black and white there as opposed to pure white right here. But really it's gonna be the size that gives it away, right away on these guys. There we go. Now these are some of my photos from my uh, backyard uh, feeder cam. This is a new thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's a red winged blackbird right here with that patchy red and yellow. So this is what it looks like up close and personal. Um, they call them epaulets. This Carolina wren, very, very distinguishable. Wrens are, um, they have a very, they have that pointy tail that usually points up or wags a little bit. Um, on the Carolina wren, this eye stripe very diagnostic and what is called a commonly known as a decurve bill. So the bill curves down just a little bit and uh, that helps them probe for insects. These house finches, this is a male and a female house finch, not purple finches. We don't really have very many purple finches around here. They do, they're around, but we don't, uh, I haven't seen any in a very long time. Mostly it's house finches. Um, you can tell they're house finches because of the stripes here on the chests of both of these birds. This is the female, that's the male. Um, the uh, purple finches are more of a raspberry color and they do not have the strikes, the little striations on the chests at all. Um, all the females do a little bit, but the males don't. Um, so the red patches, the conical finch beaks, the very pointed, you know, cone-shaped beast uh, beaks. Ah, uh, here we go. There's a tufted titmouse up here on the left. The little pointy beak, the little crest up here, very gray, very white, and these huge eyes. They have really, really big eyes for the size of the bird. Uh, they tend to. They will flock with juncos and chickadees. So those are the birds you usually see at your feeders in the winter time because they hang out together. They, they, they're, they have a symbiotic relationship. They all pretty much eat the same thing. So they, they strength in numbers kind of a thing. They're the ones you see in your feeder in the winter. This photo was taken last week at the Washington County Grasslands. This is a male or a yeah, male snow bunting beautiful bird. Uh, it is of the bunting family, so it's a short beak. Uh, they are grassland birds. They uh, generally hang out with uh, horned larks, which are another grassland bird. In winter, grassland birds, I should say. Those, these, uh, they are probably heading, they'll be heading back north, back up to uh, uh, the Canadian border and up into Canada very soon and to be replaced by the other grassland birds, the summer birds, which are bobolinks and meadow larks. But just seeing one of these on a, on a, on a pole was 
not something we expected to see. I expected them to, to be closer to the ground. There is one up, there were a couple of them up on a on this wire. That was great to be able to get a good shot, a good picture of one. This uh, this barred owl, this is a, another very distinctive bird, very large, not as big as a great horned owl, but pretty big. Uh, heavy brown streaks, as you can see. And they're one of the very few owls with brown eyes. Usually owls have the big yellow eyes, but they are brown and they're diurnal, which means they hang out in the daytime. They're more visible in the daytime. They also have a very distinctive call. And uh, if you, and it's easy to imitate. So it's like, like that. Uh, although I'm not doing it very well, but uh, they will answer you back. So that's kind of, it's, I think it's really cool. I've had them answer me back. <laughs> it's, uh, and sometimes they'll get curious enough to come closer, but uh, don't expect it to happen because it probably won't, but uh, they've been known to do that. But they're a, it's a beautiful bird. They are wood, um, owls prey on other owls. So a great horned owl will prey on a barred owl, which will prey on a screech owl, which will prey on a saw wet owl, which is a little itty bitty owl, which you very rarely will see. Um, you can hear them, but you can't see them. And uh, that's just an interesting thing that, you know, something will prey on something smaller, even it's in the same family. Okay, so how do we ID birds that we've never seen before? Okay, so, you can go to online searches, allaboutbirds.org, uh, Common Street, ASCR, that's the, Albany, all, uh, the Society of Capital Region, Audubon Society. Uh, there's bird guides online, other birders. So you can always email a question in to any one of the bird organizations around here. There's Merlin app, there's eBird, there's iNaturalist. Um, there's also, um, Yep, the bird guides, bird books. I am big on uh, myself. I always carry a field guide with me, a hard copy field guide. It's a paperback Roger Torrey Peterson field guide. Sometimes you can't get that app up there fast enough. Um, I think it's easier. I know my bird books by heart. So I know them very well. If I think, oh yeah, I know this, this is you know such and such, or this might be this family or whatever. But some people uh, noticed last last week I led a bird uh, the bird trip to the Washington County wet, uh, grasslands and most of those people that I was with were Union College students and they all had their phones out so they were all working with their apps they're used to it um, I suppose someday I'll get used to it too but for me it's easier to flip through that guide so you could bring have both you know that's uh, certainly acceptable. And okay, so this this is a this is kind of a I think more of a, a for younger people or for inexperienced. And how would you how would you describe this bird? Well, all right. So the obvious is what it's doing. It's on a tree branch. It has a stiff tail. It has this very heavy, chisely, pointy beak, and it's red and white and black. So, and also if you look at the feet, although it's hard to see, um, the, uh, the feet, the claws the, are backwards and frontwards. That's to grip on those branches. So this actually, this is how you would describe it. It's one of the ladder backs. So it's got a lot of stripes there, but this red, and so you look at it and you say, that looks, that sure looks like a woodpecker. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, it was named uh, after the red-headed woodpecker was already named. So therefore they couldn't name it a red-headed red, red woodpecker because that's already been there named. So they called it red-bellied because if you look at, not in this photo, but another, you could look at other photos of them online and see that there is a very reddish tinge to the underside of the bird. So that's how they got their name. So these slides are, are for, uh, from Cornell Lab, these next few slides. 
and how would we create bird friendly habitats? So how would we make it make our backyards or our areas more more likely to have birds hang out there? So we provide shelter, water, and food resources for them. So native plants. Last year I did a native plant talk. This is really important because if you don't supply plants, the insects don't come. And if the insects don't come, the birds won't come. And these things are so intricately uh, connected that you can't have one without the other. Um, I will be getting to that shortly here. So shelter, this is a, this brush pile, it's called a snag. Um, what I've done and, you know, people do this and this is not my area, my, my, my land or anything, but piles of brush serve as shelters for birds, uh, especially they can hide in there. They can hide from predators. Um, not just so it's it's nice for them to have places for them to hang out and hide because that's what you know they they don't like to be out in the open because it's an open invitation to get chewed up by a predator which they really obviously don't want bluebird boxes now if you look at this bluebird box it does have some chewing around the edges right there uh probably squirrel um i have several bird boxes that look like that with the little chewed edges you know, sometimes squirrels will get in there, sometimes not. Um, I try to prevent that, um, but uh, not always is going to be successful. The, I bought a new bird, uh, one of those fancy ones last year, and had two bluebird clutches in one year. So I was very pleased it was kind of worth the money. But I've had bluebirds nest in similar ones to this, too. So, you know, it's it's kind of a you know, they're going to be where they are, you know, they're, they're going to be where they feel comfortable. And it's, and sometimes they're going to get preyed on. And it's unfortunate. Uh, actually, wrens will, house wrens will drive bluebirds out. So that's another thing to think about too, when you're putting up your bluebird, uh, your bluebird box, you're going to have to understand that there, there could be other birds that are, that are going to roost in there, or they're going to build nests in there. Natural food resources. We want to be able to feed our birds things that they're going that they normally find that co-evolved with. Um, hummingbirds go after the tubular flowers, the tubular red flowers, tubular blue flowers. They will go after. Uh, it's always good to have plants blooming, uh, things blooming for them from spring right up until first frost, because they're uh, and even after that. I leave my uh, all my plants, uh, let them all go until springtime when the when uh, it's time to get out there and dig in the soil again, which is pretty soon, another month or so. Um, because goldfinches like this will feed on seeds from the uh, the echinacea that we plant, the, the uh, black-eyed Susans and the coneflowers and the monarda, all those, the bee balm that is, uh, and ironweed, joe pie weed, all these things that we leave up for them, the birds will eat that. That's a natural food for them that helps them out in times when they can't, you know, when you don't put your feeders out. Actually, it's, you know, Birds are going to survive without the feeders. Um, they're going to go for the natural stuff, although we make it easier for them by, by putting out food for them. But natural food resources is really where they're going to go first. And water. Uh, if you can, uh, keep a heated bird bath around, a water source for them. I have a heated bird bath. Um, it really is helpful for them to be able to find something where they can get water uh, during the, especially during cold weather. It's it's really uh, it's really beneficial to have. There we go. Keeping birds safe. Oh, here we go. This is a Cooper's hawk, <laughs> and those feathers that I just showed you, that's from a Cooper's hawk, probably. Uh, we do have, Cooper's hawks tend to hang out near feeders. It is, it's nature. Uh, that's why we put up the snags. It gives them places to, gives the bird, the little passerine perching birds places to hide. But we really kind of, 
we don't really want to see them get hit. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, but also Cooper's Hawks have to eat too. So, you know, it is what it is. We can keep, if we can keep our cats indoors, um, some people have outside cats and some people have barn cats. I used to have barn cats a long time ago. Uh, I find that my two cats that I have now are not outside cats at all, but I have neighbors that have outside cats that do come over to my land and try to hunt. I'm hoping that they get the mice and not the birds. Uh, disease. So uh, it's a good idea to clean your feeders and clean your uh, bird boxes. Um, I clean my bird boxes once a year. We go out and clean them out and just kind of make sure they're not disgusting or anything like that. As far as the feeders are concerned, um, I clean mine every couple of weeks. Um, go out and shake them out, clean them out, hose them out a little bit if it's not too cold. Windows, that's another thing we're going to get into shortly. There we go. And there's predators. These two, the Cooper's Hawk and Sharp Shinned, are very similar. You can see with the crosswise stripes on the coop as opposed to the lengthwise stripe on the Sharp Shinned. Sharp Shinned are also very, a lot smaller, but they're almost, you know, on, on the fly, they're almost indistinguishable. But you can see differences here with the eye color, the head shape. Head shape is a little bit bigger here. But those are the common bird feeder predators that you're going to see. Okay, window stripes. Uh, this is awful. Uh, we've all had them. It's probably one of the biggest causes of bird death. Um, it just ever, I mean, even more than cats and even more than regular predators, which are not um, regular bird predators like hawks. Or that's natural stuff, but windows aren't. There's just, just, in, just unbelievable number of windows in the world. We have lost probably 3 billion birds over the last, you know, since uh, I'm trying to think what that statistic was. I can't remember if it was since, you know, very recently. So it's not a, you know, it's not as, uh, not all of a sudden, but it's certainly 3 billion. That's a huge amount. So it's due to lots of things. It's due to climate change and habitat loss and windows. It's a big deal. So if we put up, a, a grid like this, um, I have one on my big sliding glass door in the back. Um, it helps prevent the birds from flying through. This is just awful to see something like this. Um, it's, it's, you know, they're not going to survive. Uh, this is what happens. They either die on the spot or if they do fly away, it is more than likely that they will not survive anyway because they have internal internal bleeding or internal hemorrhaging, uh, uh, you know, internal damage that they're going to die the next day, you know, probably. Um, there's just look at all that. That's just one little area, but you can imagine how many windows there are there. So that's just most strikes. Uh, appear or most strikes happen with regular residential homes or mid-rise, not necessarily high-rise, but mid-rise uh, buildings because the birds just don't, they fly at a certain height. Um, this is kind of an interesting thought, this little, uh, it kills the fit and the unfit. In nature, nature picks out the weak and the, uh, the ill for predation and to, you know, to die off, and it's the survival of the fittest, and that's just the way nature works, but window collisions kill even the fit birds, so it could kill off, you know, perfectly healthy male or female bird or female bird with uh, chicks in the nest, so these things, you try to prevent this as much as we can. Bird collisions, um, birds can't see glass, they don't have any concept of glass. So they think it's something they can either fly through or it's if it's reflecting your, your backyard or whatever, they're gonna fly into that glass. Uh, sometimes see-through glass like this. Um, so that's those like window walkways you see up above buildings or 
uh, a lot of see-through glass will that'll get them because they think they can fly right through it because they don't have any concept of glass. Solutions to this problem. We have, there's, there's different brand names for a lot of this stuff. Some of it's more expensive than others. Um, I think that netting, um, I got mine from Amazon. If anybody wants my connection to that, I'd be more than happy to send that to you. That was really cheap. And we built a frame for a four by eight slider and put that up there and it's great. And they bounce right off of it. Um, there's commercially available window tape that you can put on that's pretty much invisible. You put it on your window in kind of a grid pattern and which is not really visible in these pictures, but it's there. Uh, parachute cord, you can hang that from your eaves down outside and uh, just make sure that it's at a two inch interval so the birds won't try to fly through it. Decals, evenly spaced, you can see by right here, there's a lot of, you can't just put like one decal per window and expect that to work, it's not gonna happen. There is a uh, product called Kaleidoscape, window film and that looks like this the uh the uh ads you see on buses where they can people can see out but you can't see in um so the birds can't see in they can't try they won't try to fly through it but you can see out your window which is kind of what we want um there's some brand names uh the american bird conservancy actually sells bird tape um and that's at least a nonprofit rather than going to, you know, you can buy it from a nonprofit and you're supporting the nonprofit rather than going and buying it commercially. You can also paint your windows with tempera paint, uh, which like school rooms, I would suggest more than that. And then keeping window blinds partially closed. In other words, you bring them down, close them just a little bit so that bird will not try to go through there because it's not seeing anything it thinks it can fly through. <laughs> why birds matter okay birds matter they are a big part of an integral part of the great circle of life without birds we wouldn't have pollination and we wouldn't have seed spreading and we wouldn't have uh they're beautiful they're uh you know they're a part of what we are familiar with they're fun to look at uh physical beauty, an infinite variety, that's true, but they are part of the circle of life. Without them, we would not have insects. Without that, you know, that plants, it's just, it's the great circle of life. We can all make a difference. Uh, we can all do what we want to do to help birds survive. Um, you know, I think that it's, uh, imperative that we do that because we are losing lots and lots of birds and uh, the more birds we lose to uh, that's another you know uh, a big thing as far as lighting at night keep your lights off at night especially during migration times um, try to do what we can to help them survive because without like i said without them we don't have much of a world without them Okay, so uh, here's, I'm thanking here Saratoga Plan, Audubon Society of the Capital Region, Cornell, and the National, Aud there's a resource page. I did send it to, um, I sent it to Don, but I will be more than hap um, happy to send it along to you, Fred, so you can pass it along to everybody here that wants it. It's a good resource page. There's lots of places around here to, it lists all the places around, or as many places as I could think of anyway, to go around here, important bird areas. Um, like for instance, Fisher Ferry, everybody probably knows about Fisher Ferry, the, the Pine Bush, Black Creek Marsh, Fort Edward Grasslands, Thatcher Park, um, Moreau, and, uh, uh, one place I did not put on here, which is the place in Niskayuna, somebody mentioned earlier, the Kelly Adirondack Center. It's a beautiful place. It's just gorgeous. Saratoga Park, Saratoga National Park. Um, the sheet that I, that I sent earlier also contains field guides, bird, ge just general birdhouse information, some apps that you can put on. Uh, citizen science opportunities like uh, Project, Project Feeder Watch and uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, 
places to visit. Um, personally, I like uh, the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. It is kind of a trip from here, but they have some gorgeous raptors up there, including a male and female snowy owl. Uh, they are caged separately because they would literally kill each other if they were together. Um, Tivoli Lake Preserve, uh, Landis Arboretum, Pine Hollow Arboretum, that's, uh, that's some, that kind of a very little known Albany County uh, Arboretum, Five Rivers Wilton Wildlife Preserve up here in Saratoga County, um, and there are also organizations that you can get involved in, and if uh, I'm there's our Carolina Wren saying, thank you. Okay, and I do thank you for your participation. Thanks for listening. I hope I wasn't too boring today. And uh, that is there are questions and attempts to answer. So if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Carol. Uh, you can stop the screen share. Okay. Uh, I don't have any questions in the chat yet. Nobody's raising their virtual hand, but I have a question. Okay. Uh, I know that birds need to eat constantly to uh, maintain their metabolism. Uh, I'm wondering, in the winter, I'm, I'm guessing their natural food supply is quite diminished compared to the you know, warmer weather. Do they have a harder time feeding in the uh, winter? Yes and no. Um, it did, uh, definitely the vermivores will have a harder time. They, it's, uh, but that's been happening for millennia. So it's not something that should be uh, like all, it's not a new phenomenon that they won't find food in the winter time. They will find food. Uh, so not feeding them with a bird feeder is not necessarily going to diminish the bird, you know, that bird population. Um, yeah, it's always harder for any creature to find food in the winter time. Um, so it's nature doing what nature does. So sometimes it's going to call out some of the weaker of the species. It happens. It happens with deer. It happens with, you know, all creatures. So not a, uh, so it, but it's not going to kill off the population if we don't put our bird feeders out. Thank you. Uh, Sherry had a, a question. Sure. I, I do. Um, very interesting. Uh, I wanted to share, there's a bird feeder that works very well for keeping out non-bird uh, guests called Squirrel Be Gone. And uh, various places have it, Lowe's had it, and it, it is wonderful. It, it's weight, um, it, it has a safety for the weight and it's just darling and I recommend it. And uh, I saw it at a friend's and she just had tons of birds. and. It really is squirrel proof. Um, I did have a question for you about the type of food. I know you said the red millet was not good uh, and to get a good quality, but other than spending a lot, can you tell us some of the ingredients that we would be looking for? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't cover that earlier. Um, what I like and what I've been using for years are regular black oil sunflower seeds. Mm -hmm. So those are you know, that's a, um, those are for cardinals, for chickadees, for just about any bird, uh, except like I said, the vermivores, the insectivores. Um, also the yellow or the regular yellow millet, cracked corn. Um, sometimes, you know, I don't really use it a lot simply because it invites squirrels and uh, deer, which, you know, we, you know, shoo, go away. We don't really want them. Uh, <laughs> I like the uh, fruit and nut blend because that, that um, any of the fruit eating birds will go to that too. So you get a little bit more variety of bird. Um, so I get uh, uh, my usual juncos. So I, it's basically, I like a fruit and nut blend. I also like safflower uh, seeds safflower hearts and sunflower hearts. I buy those separately and then kind of mix them together. Cardinals just love them. It's a big cardinal draw. Um, they also like black, just regular black oil sunflower seeds that they can crack open too, because that's more natural for them to do. But that's, you know, it's nice to have those little sunflower and safflower hearts out there. Goldfinches love those too. And also Niger seed. It's a little teeny tiny seed for uh, uh, goldfinches just love them. And what is the difference between, you mentioned black oils, 
um, sunflower. How is that different from not black oil? Black oil is the one that most preferred by birds. They'll, you know, they'll eat the regular sunflower seeds, but I think that that's the black oil sunflower seeds are larger. Um, they're uh, easier for the birds to, or to crack open, and that's just a preference for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob Bosca had a question. Okay. I had Bob. Uh, yeah, I, um, I had a couple of big trees cut down. They were both in bad shape with a lot of dead branches. And in retrospect, because of the winds, it was a good idea to have them down. But I want to put up uh, some more trees. I just have a small uh, piece of land in um, Schenectady. It's in, uh, in the Upper Union Street area. And um, was question if you had any recommendation as far as plants to put in, because I plan to do some planting, including probably a couple of new trees. Okay. Uh, in the, I think, uh, in the uh, spring. yeah. Not a birch. Don't plant a birch. Yeah, don't plant. Well, birch trees are good, but I think for cover and for regular, you want something, especially about if you're going to build or if you're going to put a tree in, I would go for uh, the yeah, regular maple trees, like a, uh, or, you know, the Acer species, the, not a Norway maple, but a native maple, like a red maple or a sugar maple. Yes, they take a long time to grow, but they're, it's going to be there. You know, you'll probably see it grow and it's uh, going to be nice cover for them. Maple, robins love maple trees. Um, also, if you want something a little faster growing, uh, box elder, which is in the Acer species, but it's a um, it's a faster growing tree, but it's part of that maple family. Yeah, because I, I, I do have, I think it's a Norway maple that my neighbor has that it's a huge tree that's leaning over my garage, but it's <laughs> not in the places where I have the trees taken down. And, and is, is, is there anything... Um, also, there was a tree that was taken down by the by the street. I didn't ask for it, but they did it anyway. Um, um, and I wanted to try to replace that something. Is there something relatively short short that wouldn't interfere but would help with the? Uh... Yes, uh, all sorts of native uh, shrubs. Some of the dogwoods, oh, um, and also service berry, which is. Um, the uh, which is called shad blow. That's another good one too. That's a uh, uh, sir. It's called service berry. You can find those all over now, especially the native plant growers. They're very popular. They're it's a it's a, a nice little tree. It provides fruit. Uh, you'll see uh, you know, little flowers on it, and it, it does bear fruit. And it's it's just a beautiful little. You know, it's really helpful for for birds. They love them. Yeah, and one, one last question about, yeah, planting is I do have a number of small rows of Sharon bushes that were seeded from my neighbor okay. uh, that started in my backyard, and I understand that they can be, uh, you know, like very aggressive and take over, mm -hmm. and is it best to take them all out, or is it and how how would how was it a, would affect the bird population to leave some? Um, actually, you're better off pulling them all out and and putting in something else. Um, I I don't have any roses sharing up here, but um, I personally, I mean, if you've got land that's protected from deer, you can put in um, a red cedar, white cedar, um, any one of this like a little nine bark or something like that, little shrubs that are really beneficial they're native red or white cedar right you know, the um oh gosh I'm trying to remember the yeah any one of the osier species or the dogwoods flowering dogwood regular it's a dogwood um red twig dogwood i love red twig dogwood and silk dogwood uh, they're they're beautiful and they they provide winter interest too if you're into that you know if you want to look out your window and see something that isn't boring to red twig dogwood is nice yes well thank you <laughs> <laughs> save me a consult uh, i don't have any more questions i had a comment uh, i recently finished a book 
uh, called An Immense World by a fellow named Ed Young, Y-O-N-G. And it was about the senses that animals possess, sight, hearing, you know, and so forth. And he spends quite a bit of time on birds. And his conclusion was that the term bird brain is highly misused that given the varied sensory input that birds have to process instantaneously, their brains for the size of the animal is very complex and quite capable. Mm -hmm. so the term bird yes. brain is really a misnomer. Yep. A I, it's funny, we, my, uh, my husband makes fun of me. He always says, oh, you and your bird brain friends are going out. You know, like, yeah, well, you know, you know I, I know what it means. And he's not really insulting me. He just likes to tease a little bit. But uh, uh, it's really true. Yes, birds are just phenomenal. And they, how, they, how do they migrate? You know, how, how they, it's just fascinating to me is how much they know, how much they remember. If you, uh, if you look at uh, blue jays, for instance, which is, you know, a very common bird, and we take them for granted, but they, they're amazing in that they will plant something and then remember where they put it and go get that later on when, uh, when they're hungry. Um, unless a squirrel comes and gets it first, which we've all seen happen. I think we have, I've seen it happen on my trail cams. I think it's hilarious. It's blue jay will bury something and a squirrel will come along right after it and pull it out. <laughs> but, but I, I, my front, uh, my front porch, I've got a couple of, uh, wind or, uh, deck boxes and, uh, rail, rail boxes and blue jays put items in there. They'll put peanuts in there, little nut acorns and things. And that, it's just, you know, that's pretty darn cool. <laughs> so they, they are very, very smart. Uh, crows have very, very uh, amazing social structures. So they're, they're not stupid by, and some birds actually learn to use tools, corvids especially, which are crows and ravens and uh, jays. It just fascinates me. Thank you. Rosina had a question. What about native plants for birds? Ah, lots of different native plants for birds. <laughs> uh, the uh, cone, purple coneflower, any one of the uh, sunflower species, the Heliopsis, uh, Coreopsis, Monarda, which is the bee balm, either the regular uh, Monarda fistulosa, which is the native bee balm, or spotted bee balm, mountain mint, just about any native plant is going to be beneficial because not only do they feed the birds with seeds, they also attract the insects which lay their eggs, which get the caterpillars, which feed the baby birds in the spring. Um, that is a big thing. Native plants plus birds equals, you know, the, equals what makes the girl, world go round. So in the more native plants that you plant, the more birds you'll see. Thank you. And Sherry had another question. Okay. On a second. Uh, hang on. <laughs> I, I'm going to confess a couple of things that you might find amusing. When I first moved up here, uh, the first, I was from New York City, and the first time I saw a hummingbird, my, my kids were near a sandbox by uh, a perennial garden in Glenville. I forget the name of it. It has changed hands a few times. And I thought this was the biggest bee in the world. And my mama bear instincts, you know, I was between the, the bird and the kids or I, the, the bird was between the kids and me. And, you know, for like a split second, all my, my brain neurons are triggering and firing. And then I realized it must be a hummingbird, but I had never seen one before in my life. And I just you know, when I thought it was in the bee family, was scared out of my britches. When I knew that it was in the bird family, I was delighted. Uh, so, so that's one of, that's my first, oops. <laughs> that's uh, great. The, the other is, and now I, I feed them and I just love them. Uh, I have one on my porch and I can sit literally feet from it. I mean, it, it's just the most miraculous thing. The other kind of, uh, let's laugh at Sherry's story is I had, I didn't realize owls could be daytime diurn diurnal. I learned a new word. Um, and I kept hearing what sounded like an owl during the day. And I'm just trying to find an owl. You know, I've seen owls before. And then I realized it is a morning dove. <laughs> yes. And I just, I, I want to say, I, I think it's good to laugh at oneself. 
but but that is like my biggest chuckle. Uh, I do have a question here. Uh, the difference, and if you covered it, I apologize, but the difference between crows and blackbirds, I don't find them particularly attractive, uh, but what is the difference to distinguish? Oh, well, first of all, crows are much bigger than regular, uh, you know, the blackbirds that we see around here, the rusty blackbird and the regular uh, cow brown-headed cowbird is one of the icterid species too, and the orioles are blackbirds, they're the blackbird family. What does uh, icterid mean? Icterid is, is that family. It's okay. uh, the blackbird family, the pointy little long pointy beaks, uh, generally short tailed. Um, um, I'm trying to think of the other diagnostics, a lot of black, but the crows are entirely black. They're much larger and they are the corvid family. So they include blue jays, ravens, uh, Stellar's jays, gray jays, all the jay family. So it's a different family of birds. Uh, if you look at the beaks, they're different. You know, there's different shape. Uh, crows are very thick beak because they're they're kind of um, what they call omnivorous. So they'll eat just about anything, which we already know, garbage, you know, <laughs> dead things on the side of the road, whatever. Um, and uh, so that's the major, you know, and crows have a different social structure too. They are, they're highly social. Uh, that's why you see huma, and also, you know, icterids will be too. They're, uh, but this is a smaller group, but they're different in that how they communicate. And, uh, it's uh, just kind of amazing. But anyway, the, the size will be the feel diagnostic. Huge. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh yeah, if I could, Carol. Um, first, I'd like to put a plug in again also for the service barrier, the shad blow. I had one at my last house, and they're very slow growing, which is kind of nice if you have limited space. And they do blossom in the spring very quickly. You have to look fast. It's only for a few days, but then they do have the berries. So they really are a nice, simple tree. Secondly, um, not last spring, I had an attack sparrow. <laughs> and I read up on them because this uh, this sparrow was attacking the window, the windows in my living room. And I, I read that they can be very territorial mm -hmm. and somewhat aggressive with other, like the males with other males. So, of course, the sparrow could see itself in the windows and would spend hours literally jumping at the window, flying at the window, jumping out of the trees next to the window. So I tried first covering the windows in my living room with newspaper. It looked lovely. The neighbors most <laughs> loved it, but I had them covered. And the darn thing switched its attention to my kitchen windows. <laughs> and this is going on for weeks. And it's very disturbing because the thing is hitting the window, scratching at the window, thumping into the window. So then I read to try fluorescent yellow marker in a grid shape. Tried that all over my windows. And I also had a door that comes down almost, the glass comes almost down to the ground and it would sit there and attack the door. The fluorescent stuff didn't help. But I finally just put my blinds down, as you said, and kept them tilted. And it must have disturbed. I didn't know if it was coincidence. Maybe I thought, well, the sparrow finally found a lovely family situation. <laughs> it was leaving me alone. But maybe it was that. I just kept the blinds down and tilted so that it must have disturbed the image. Yep. Um, that's what, at the window. Yeah, that's what happened. It, it broke up that reflective mm -hmm. space. It was amazing, though, and exhausting. I was sort of exhausted from it. And I kept thinking how exhausting this must be for that little bird to just be so into fighting with, you know, with its image. That happens a lot with, especially, uh, you know, definitely breeding season with, um, especially robins and cardinals. If you have a car and you've got your car, uh, the window car windows or the, uh, the rear view mirror, they will go after that rear view mirror constantly. Mm -hmm. So it's good to cover it up with story. something, you know, take it like a piece of burlap and just put it over that in your driveway or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, just, uh, that amazes me too about birds. They'll keep doing that. Yeah. We've had woodpeckers attacking windows and, uh, and one 
whacking at, uh, uh, actually last week I saw one uh, pileated woodpecker up on a telephone pole hitting it against that. And it just, yeah, it does. They, you know, they think they're going to get something out of it that they're going to do it. So they <laughs> sometimes are successful. I mean, but you know, creosote in telephone poles is kind of like, ugh, you know, but it doesn't mean that the insects aren't there. Right. Roland had a question next. Yes. Roland. Yeah, I um, I didn't have a question, but Rosini, you just took about my whole story away. Really. <laughs> I had a bluebird um, mm -hmm. last year, and uh, it was a feed. I had you know a pair living in a birdhouse on the side of the chicken house, and she, the the female, would fly, flutter up to the window, and then drop down and rest and fly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and like you say, for uh, you know a long time, and I, I it broke my heart because she was exhausting herself. So I I got some sheets of plastic, this uh, opaque, you know the it blurred the the image of the bluebird she was going after, and I put it on all the the windows of the <laughs> the, the uh, chicken house, and that stopped her. Next thing you know, I see her up on another building where I have my car stored. I mean, she's up there flying at the window <laughs> yeah. down there. She thought the bird was up there. Yeah. And um, and this is the thing about birds sometimes and everything. One time I went out there and there, in that building, there was a little hole in the glass in the window pane. She had flown through the hole and then she couldn't find her way out of the building. Oh. And she was, she died. Oh, that's uh, that was just, that was a sad thing, but uh, th th this is you know like you say, birds are birds, and they they get themselves into some funny predicaments sometimes, and uh, it's it's tough to it's tough to watch. But anyway, it, it, uh, the bluebirds are a beautiful bird. It was amazing too to me that the 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 male bluebird. He would come and sit on the fence and he'd just watch her. He wouldn't, he wasn't uh participating in protecting the territory or anything. But uh it was it was crazy. But anyway, I I've had good luck getting bluebirds for Yeah, they're, they're a beautiful bird. They I always uh they when they fly, I thought they they fly like they love to fly. They you know, they <laughs> around and everything. And somebody told me, I think down at Five Rivers, that the bluebird carries the sky on its back. It oh, there. that's a beautiful scent. I like that. That's yeah, that, yeah. It's beautiful. They're they're gorgeous, and they they capture our hearts. They, yeah. uh, we're it, uh, your little presentation here was was great, Carol. I uh, I've followed the birds for a long time, and I, I picked up half a dozen interesting little things on it. It was a great presentation. Oh, thank yeah. you. I there's birds around here are there's birds actually I haven't seen in years and uh among them indigo buntings which is something oh, yeah. more field areas than like I'm more woodsy up here where I am so it's not you know they won't be up here but yeah. uh, uh, you know there's any kind of field area also um we have and we've had lots of orioles up here but you don't get to see them that often and yeah. uh, yeah. Through them and I, I put out my orange feeder in the in the springtime. As a matter of fact, I'm due to put that out very soon because they will they're coming back and uh yeah. put the orange out there in the jelly and uh yeah. hope for the best. But I've had them come to the hummingbird feeder. It's weird. Also, uh uh, uh woodpeckers show up at the hummingbird feeders too, which is crazy. I um I hadn't um I had never seen a red bellied woodpecker. And um, one morning I was laying in bed and I had the windows open and I heard this kind of a squawking noise there. And I, and I heard it again and again. And I thought, what is that? And I went and looked on the bird feeder and that's the first time I'd ever seen one. And now they're common. So I, I think it's climate change. They're moving into the territory of birds that I had never seen before you see now. And then others that you see, had seen regular like the uh grosbeaks the evening grosbeaks and stuff i don't see them anymore so. no they have actually and it's kind of documented now that they have they've shifted their their 
migration period or migration path a little further west so oh, out more yeah. towards Ithaca because of climate change and because of oh. things go we used to see them all the time they you know they come in in that right. humongous group and then they clean you out of your bird feed and then go yeah, away. Right, right. <laughs> clean you out and go and mm. uh, you know we used to see them all the time but yeah. I haven't seen any years and uh, I still see rose breasted once in a while yes. but yeah they're they do hang out here because at least there's stuff for them to eat here they're not as they, they don't hang out as big groups like that like <laughs> big do yeah. yeah bob uh what has a question somebody else you're yeah bob is muted I, uh, yeah it's it's okay. not a question it's uh just a comment about the only thing that i have against birds <laughs> is that i have a a hybrid car that I sometimes take a, a cup, it's a couple of blocks away from me. It's a parking area behind a um, uh, Brugger's Bagel's place. Anyway, when I park there to charge the car, there's a huge tree in the neighbor's <laughs> property. And every once in a while, there's like a whole flock of birds that lands there. And when I come back after the car is charged, my car will be just covered with oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I wish there was a way to save it for you know fertilizing my plants but <laughs> <laughs> not so best thing to do is just bring it to your car wash or get it washed so it doesn't so the uh so it does, your finish on your car doesn't get ruined yeah. carol Sorry. the the most amazing excuse me Oops. uh there's people who've raised their hand and we're running out of time okay. so i'd like uh, to get to the Question, Sherry, you got a question? I'm also going to address what Bob was saying. ShopRite has chargers and they're not under trees. Um, and I wanted to ask Carol about the bird box that was a better investment that doesn't allow squirrels to get in. It's uh, Duncraft. Uh, I did buy it on sale from Duncraft. D-U-N? Uh, D-U-N-C-R-A-F-T. Okay. That's a, that's a, they've been around a long time. They have, you know, a lot of what they call squirrel proof feeders. I find that not much is squirrel proof, but you've had the, those weighted ones are probably one of the best out there and they do have the weighted ones. Um, squirrels will get into anything. It just amazes me too. They're very good at doing that. Um, but the Duncraft, that's, it's got a guard on it, a like a little metal guard around the hole so yeah. that prevents the squirrel from chewing that open. Right, right. Um, I also had a question about the, uh, first I wanted to just comment my displeasure at Blue Jays. I think they just have a nasty temperament and should be <laughs> therapy and anger management because every time you say blue bird, I think of Blue Jays and a Blue Jay actually once attacked my husband's head when he was running. Uh, so I have a personal issue. Pardon? They were blue birds. Oh, th yes. then I take back my resentment. I had to change my route. <laughs> uh, but um, I wanted to uh, ask about suet. There are so many different varieties um, and I don't know if it's just hype and salesmanship or if there's an actual di difference and if you'd recommend one over the other. I usually go through and I'll, um, I like tractor supply up here in Clifton Park. Um, Tractor supply is great because it's reasonable and you can just get the 12 pack of suet. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty much universal. They have different kinds, you know, they have ones with berries in them, ones with orange pieces in them. It's, you know, whatever. I think it's, it's the fat that makes the difference, not necessarily the other content. I would stay away from the stuff with the, with the, um, just it's a personal thing for me with the red pepper in it. Supposedly the capsaicin in the red pepper will keep the squirrels out. I don't find that that's necessarily true. And I just think it's a marketing tool. Um, I just buy the, not the cheapest suet I can get, but the, you know, those little four by four cakes that they have, um, you can get a 12 pack and it's reasonable and it lasts, you know, quite a while before they, uh, you know, most your squirrels get it, which, you know, they'll clean you out in a day, but uh, um, yeah, there's, there's, 
there's little like little fruit pieces in some of sometimes I'll, I'll augment and I'll put a little bit uh, I'll buy one of those and put that in along with the rest of the plain ones but it's mostly the fat that makes the difference and there are some people who literally make their own with peanut butter um I don't do that because I just don't have the I don't have the room for that you need a big enough freezer to be able to freeze that and then cut it up into into uh, four by four chunks to fit into your uh, into your suet feeders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And Audrey or Major had a question? Um, not a question, a comment. First, I wanted to thank Carol for a very informative presentation. Thank you. And, um, summer before last, we were entertained for the whole summer and probably into the fall mm -hmm. with the family of wild turkeys. It was it was wonderful. Every single day, they, the mother bird will come out with I don't know what was it seven, seven yeah. ducklings and watching her teach them and stuff. It was it was awesome. Oh, they're I yeah. think wild turkeys are fat. Oh, thank you for that because wild turkeys are something you don't. I don't see them too much up here anymore. We used to see them all the time, but there's a solar farm uh, down the road which used to be a big hangout for the turkeys because it was a former cornfield. So the bur or the turkeys would hang out there. Not so much anymore. So, you know, good and bad about solar power. You know, yes, we like the solar, but it has a detrimental effect. But but turkeys are wonderful to watch and they can be they can be aggressive too. If you you've probably read the stories about people having turkeys down in their workplaces and having them chase you. <laughs> Same with Canada geese too. But thank you, thank you all. And I appreciate this and I- um, thank you. Yeah.